I also consulted my colleagues throughout the nation who I've been spending time on, on Zoom meetings with. Uh, at one point in time, every 10 days, we all got together to share our panic, to share our problems, to share whatever solutions we had been able to come up with to keep speech and debate alive and well throughout the nation. So some of the things I share with you today will be their feedback um, uh, from Illinois and Michigan in particular. Uh, Michigan who ran the first virtual state meet of all of us that occurred in their season. So lots of things that we've gleaned from other people. And we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that Melissa gets in so she can share with you on the collegiate level as well, some of the issues and the challenges and the reflection she's been able to have. Let's talk first about the things that we endured. And I want this to be very positive. So I avoided listing some things. Um, I avoided that just simply because I want it to be extremely positive. And I know if, if you look at social media, sometimes I feel like that's all we see is the negative. So we're going to talk more about what you and I truly experienced. And I think the first thing, not just as coaches, uh, not just as teachers, not just as a state director, but on a personal level, we, for the first time in our lives, had a lack of socialization where I don't know how many people you got to see, but I can tell you that on March 13th, we got an email from the University of Texas where our building is located that said, this university is shut down. Our executive director said, come, we need to have a quick staff meeting. So we all drove into Austin, went into the building, had a very brief, uh, meeting on what little we knew at that point in time about what the future would be like, thinking that uh, we would probably lock down for a week or two and then life would be normal again. Can we all chuckle real loud at that statement? <laughs> life as normal. Uh, what is normal anymore? That was March 13th. And I know a lot of your schools have reopened and you have had face-to-face -face teaching with your students. Let me share with you that we have actually crowned six champions in all 30 of our high school competitions, as well as our athletics and our music. And we have all still been working remotely. Our building is under lockdown. We cannot go into it without special approval and time, restricted time to be able to go in. So you can imagine the dust on our desk there on the UT campus and what it's been like when we are normally working very much collaboratively as a team uh, to be able to host state champions. And we were all sitting at our desk in our own homes and having to do literally everything via email, phone, text, and of course, Zoom. So the lack of socialization, as you know, as you begin to see a lot of studies being done on this, lots of depression from folks um, that they've been so isolated, that they haven't seen people, that they haven't been able to attend church services or go to the movies or all those things that are stress relievers for us just hasn't been a part of our world. Another thing is, I think when you look at our speech teams, there's been a challenge to deal with the lack of engagement. Uh, seniors, juniors that have been in your program and been very successful for three or four years, suddenly lacking that enthusiasm of, no, I really don't want to compete on the screen again this weekend. This is just not what I signed up for because our kids, as you well know, part of the important journey of being on a forensic team is that socialization, that networking, that sharing with and getting to know other schools as, and students, as well as bonding with your own students and with their peers, important for them. And it was surprising. I had so many coaches emailing me, telling me about 
even former state champions that were saying, I'm checking out. I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to finish my senior year with the speech team because this is just not fun. So we, we dealt with a lack of engagement, that struggle of how to keep kids interested. And I'm certainly sure that you dealt with the fact of how do you take a brand new kid who's never been on the team before and convince them that this is really fun and we have a great time because you couldn't tease them with things like, well, let's get on the bus and you're going to go to a real town. You're going to eat in a restaurant. <laughs> you're going to stay in a hotel. You're going to get to have some great fun seeing different cities. It's kind of tough to sell that to a kid who's never done speech and debate before, wasn't it? I think the other thing that we endured uh, that I have a great concern about was the lack of equal playing field. We saw suddenly, uh, we've always known that we had to address the issue of equity, but we suddenly were beginning to see those teams that we knew did not have the technology that they needed. We worked with judges to try to say, don't let this enter into your ranks when students were competing in really odd places or places that had lots of distraction in the background, or we had those squads that simply didn't have the technology that they needed. If a school closed down and you couldn't have your students come to your school to use that technology and to use those computers and use that strong internet, and they were reliant on competing from their own home, which may have multiple siblings trying to use one single computer, lots of family things going on, a washing machine on when they're trying to compete, or all kinds of situations. We saw a lot of inequity there. And certainly, I know you will probably have a lot of stories to share with us about that. And we certainly tried to keep that at the forefront when we develop those best practices for you of how to try to equalize that playing field. So those are some things that I thought were key to what happened and what kind of uh, things we had to endure. What do we learn from that? I think you all get capital P's on your letter jackets for perseverance. We persevered. And you know what? I am so proud of the speech and debate community. In some ways, it was very bittersweet for me as the state director to know that when other people and other events and other activities were actually eventually getting to compete in person because we had persevered in the speech and debate world, and we had figured out an alternative, we were continuing to compete virtually. Was that a safe decision? Absolutely. Uh, but I am very proud that because of the passion, you'll notice number three, the bullet number three I have there, I think what we saw and what came out of this pandemic was we were able to persevere and we were able to be very resilient. Um, and I think that's because we're so passionate about what we do. We are not coaches and teachers whose students just show up at district and maybe have done a practice test or two in the classroom and suddenly come in to compete. Our students are competing on a regular basis all year long. Our season runs from start to finish August, all the way really to the next August with competition, preparation, practice, and that headed to those tournaments. So I think that the passion we have to be willing to give weekend after weekend after weekend to students are what brought forth that perseverance and that resilience to say, we're gonna figure out a way to make this happen. The first thing in our mind was probably no way. There's no way this can happen. But as the weeks progressed, what we saw was, yes, there were people, there were coaches, there were kids that stepped up to the plate and figured out how to make 
this happen and for speech and debate to continue to be extremely viable. I think we also had to learn patience. I wasn't very patient with myself because I was accustomed to crossing every T and dotting every I for every state tournament. I always wanted the, the bar to be very high towards perfection of our state tournaments because I felt like coaches and certainly competitors deserve that. So I found a lot of frustration with my own self in that everything was new. Everything was starting from scratch. None of the systems that Jenny and I had worked so hard through the years together to make really strong state meets suddenly were kind of out with the bathwater, got to start over, got to do things totally different than you ever had before. And you really had to reconfigure your thinking. And sometimes you didn't realize that until you got into the mode of habit. This is what we do. And this is when we do it. And all of a sudden you realized, hey, that's not going to work. So I think we all had to learn an awful lot of patience. And I'm sure for you as coaches, you had to learn a lot of patience when students tried to go online and start an event, start a competition, and things just blew up in their face. Maybe you had really worked hard with the technology to make, it, make sure it was working well. You had learned the software for that particular tournament. And all of a sudden, your kid couldn't get into a round, couldn't access the internet, whatever. If those things were going to happen, I think this year they must have happened. And I'm sure you have a lot of stories like that. So perseverance, we learned. We learned resilience. We learned passion. And even if we didn't want to, we learned patience. Jenny, I'm going to stop for a minute and ask, has Melissa made it in yet? Maybe not. Okay, I'll no, keep going. She has, okay. she has not. I just sent her the link again, so we'll see. Okay, okay I'll wait till I see her face or you come on and cue uh, me that she's well, here because I well, certainly want her to be able to present. Uh, her last email says she's giving up. Okay. All right. Well, this will be me then. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Just me. All right. Let's go back and uh, we'll talk about other things that we learned. I think through this process, many of us learned to be grateful. Grateful when things did happen, when championships were not canceled. I can tell you, I, I can't even explain the emotional feeling last year uh, in 2020. Remember I said <clears throat> March 13th was the day that our building and our campus shut down. You know what was going to happen May 14th, 15th, 16th. That was the 123A cross-examination debate state tournament. And we literally had all of our hospitality loaded up. We had all of our equipment and things to move over to the University Teaching Center to begin registration for state debate. And suddenly, you know, when people said, well, why did, why did you have to shut down? Well, when your university shuts down, you have to follow suit. And then when the governor of Texas says, schools will close, if there are no schools in session, there are no extracurricular activities. So there really wasn't an option. And even in March of 2020, I can tell you that state directors at the state office continued to discuss how can we make this happen? Maybe we just need to push it back. Let's push CX back to May. We'll push speech and academics into June. Heck, we'll even do this in July. We are willing to host these tournaments and make sure these state championships are provided for these students. And we did continue to plan. Physically, tangibly, we kept pivoting. We kept saying, we can do this and here's how we'll make a change. 
Here's how we'll make another change. Because on March 13, we really thought this was temporary. We had no idea that 18 months later, we would still be in a pandemic. We couldn't fathom that. And we knew what our commitment was to the UIL kids and to those state championships that are so very important for them to be able to participate in. So to be really honest, was I super excited? We went virtual on all four state meets for Congress, for CX, and for our speech. No, I wasn't, but I was grateful. I was grateful that we found a way in some form or fashion that kids could still have that experience because you know better than I do what the feelings have been of those seniors of 2020 who didn't have a prom, who didn't have a graduation ceremony, and who didn't have those state championships to climax a year of so much work, just like professional athletes, just like the collegiate athletes. You know, I'm a big Lady Bear Baylor University basketball fan. And here we were defending a national championship and should have been able to make that a, Nash, a second back-to-back -back national championship. And suddenly everything stopped, the whole world stopped. So in, in so many ways. So I think we learned to be grateful. We also learned that we had to be lifelong learners. How many of you in the audience today have been teaching for many, many years? 20, 25, and suddenly you were realizing that teaching had changed. You were going to be teaching online, something you had never done before. You were perhaps teaching hybrid so that you had some kids in the classroom and then you had a computer set up to also teach those online learners. We had to become lifelong learners, didn't we? We had to learn to do it even though we thought, yeah, we've never done it this way before. I have no idea how to host a virtual tournament. I see some people in the audience today who regularly run in-person tournaments. You had to shift, didn't you? And it was a big learning curve. So that's another thing was we had to be lifelong learners. And boy, did we have to be flexible and adaptable. And we had to think out of the box. We had to turn that thinking, uh, those normal routine things we did, we had to realize it's not gonna work this year. We gotta be flexible. And how many times did you have to adjust and pivot? Uh, Jenny and I could tell you a lot of stories of how many times we pivoted. If you remember, if you coach Congress, the best laid plans of mice and men <laughs> happened in October and November, discovering that even though our university was shut down and there were no university facilities that we could secure, we did have a high school, a school district who said, come and we will allow you to host your state championship in Congress here. Hours and hours, days and days and weeks and months of planning very carefully knowing that we had to provide as much safety to our students and our coaches and our schools as we possibly could. We spent that time really doing what I thought was a very strong job, a very positive job of, of going an extra mile to make sure that we had all of that safety in place. And suddenly what happens? COVID spikes again really strongly in the area where we were going to be, which had not been, there had only been three cases of COVID in that entire county when we planned that meet and suddenly there was a spike. So we took the safety route and we said, we will delay this six weeks. Even though for us at the state office, it became very difficult because we were now crossing over with two major state tournament, tournament preparations, that of Congress and that of policy debate. But we did it because we knew it was important for students and we knew we wanted to see these championships come to fruition. So we delay. And I'm thinking, we're going to be in South Texas. It's February. 
we normally wear shorts in Austin in February, I can tell you. So I thought even further down south, several hours, it's going to be warm on February 14th. Now, somebody tell me what happened on February 14th. Suddenly we had a, do you just love this word, unprecedented? We had this unprecedented snowstorm and it didn't just come and melt a few hours later like it always does in Austin. In fact, I have a son, my youngest son said, mom, I've never seen snow here before. So here we have this huge deep blanket of snow and ice. And it doesn't go away. It just, it goes on and on for seven to 10 days. And we have all these schools that are in the process of preparing to come south. Even my contest managers for the state Congress meet are on their way literally to Lavernia ISD. And I have to call and say, turn around and go home to Amarillo, <laughs> head back to the panhandle. This is not going to happen. So what did we do? Adjust and pivot. In a 24 hour time period, we had flipped that tournament from in-person to virtual. Having never run a virtual meet before, can I remind you of that? No state tournament had been virtual. So adjusting and pivoting, yeah, I'd, I'd say that definitely was part of the order of this pandemic year that we've dealt with. So, so what did I learn? And I, I hope you can share with me as well as we get further into the presentation. I, I learned that I, I have always been a problem solver and that's what my tendency is, particularly in raising four boys. You can imagine how many problems there have been. And that's what the mom mode does. Uh, we got a problem, I'll solve it, we'll figure this out. Well, what I found out was it was important to have a lot of problem solvers around me. People who could, and I, and I feel like as coaches, you probably reached out to people in your area as well that could help you problem solve. How do we deal with all these issues that virtual tournaments bring to us, such as technology? I also learned for somebody who really likes to cross those T's and dot those I's that you can't micromanage in a situation like this. You have to delegate and you have to find people that you truly trust and that you know have the expertise in areas that you no longer have because you're not doing the system as you always have. I do think that uh, teamwork makes the dream work. And I think that definitely happened this year. Um, I also learned, you know, some of us that are older probably have given the millennials a real hassle, like, God, you guys, you know, you need a good work ethic. There's so many things you need to do, millennials. And I think what we discovered was, wow, those millennials were so critical because they could step in with their background in technology that comes so natural for them. Uh, things they don't even have to learn, they just are intuitive for them, and we could, we could embrace those folks and say, we need your help. Will you step in and help us? And I thought that we had some incredible people who came in and shared their knowledge with virtual tournaments, uh, with technology, and how to make this happen, and even worked during the tournaments. We flipped a lot of staff. We have a lot of staff that's worked our state tournaments for many, many years, even decades. And we appreciate those folks. They're great. But suddenly we found that the expertise was coming from those millennials. And so we embraced them. We brought them in and they were key, I think, to competition happening. And, and those of you I know who ran invitational tournaments, many of you turned to certain individuals to sit virtually with you and help you walk through those particular tournaments. And I think you'd be the first ones to say they were invaluable. So that's another thing that we learned. And we also learned not an easy thing for me, just don't sweat the small stuff. Sometimes people have to give you grace. 
there were times when people didn't give us grace. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of people on social media not showing grace, but I, I think you just simply came to a point where we knew we couldn't sweat all that small stuff. We also had to realize that we were gonna make mistakes. And I think that's what my buddies across the nation have told me, you know what, things may not go perfect and we may not get everything right, but if we at least get it for students, that's gonna be important. Communication is always important, but certainly important in that you couldn't look downstream and say, oh my gosh, here's a problem. How can we possibly solve this? I think you always had to look up and forward. And uh, our executive director, Dr. Bradup, who's always so inspiring to us, kept saying every time I would talk to him or he'd send me an email or we would have a staff meeting, he would say, let's move forward. And that sort of became our mantra, moving forward. We may not be moving in the direction we wish we were, but it's important that we look forward rather than dwelling on the negative that we're having to deal with. I also think that I spent a lot of sleepless nights and I'm sure Jenny did as well. And lots of you did uh, when you're trying to hold your team together where you practice scenario planning. Okay, let's imagine if this happens, how are we gonna attack it? What are we gonna do? What's gonna be our policy? How do we exist in this unknown? I don't know about you, but that's not my comfort zone. Uh, I like to know what's going to happen. I like to pre-plan. And certainly this was throwing us into an abyss almost where we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know from day to day what this pandemic was going to do and how it was going to impact UIL activities. So we just learned to think about those scenarios and walk our mind through them so we were prepared should they occur. Again, I didn't think the weather was going to be snow in February. I thought it was gonna be hot and sunny. So I didn't really pre-plan that scenario by any means, but there were, I learned very quickly, you better do that. You better think of all the things that might could happen and how do we make them work? How do we approach them? And, you know, I think the last bullet is so very important. And one of the things that the Zoom meetings with people that are directors and other state associations were so valuable because we all came together week after week to say, how do we get to yes? How do we make this happen? Because it didn't appear that these state championships could happen. But we had to persevere. There comes that perseverance of how do we get to the answer yes rather than no. And I will tell you that some state associations did not have any athletics this year at all. Can you imagine Texas? <laughs> no athletics. The only events that they were able to do were those that were virtual, such as speech, debate, and a lot of people did their one act play virtually, and certainly their theatrical design. So speech, debate, theater, those kinds of events, and solo and ensemble for music, but there were states that had absolutely no athletics this year, and we just weren't going to do that at UIL with as much criticism uh, as might have been out there in the world, we kept that focus of, we're going to say yes, it's going to happen somehow. Well, let's talk about virtual. And I've seen, and I know Clint Adams is in our audience today. I'm sure he'll probably have some things to say about this because I've seen some of his discussion of, you know what, virtual is not all bad. It you and I, as communication people, will be the first ones to say communication is face to face, and that's the best thing. I don't think anybody would argue with the fact that kids get more out of <clears throat> speech and debate competition if it is in person. And there are just so many reasons why that is true. 
We have audiences in our rounds for a reason. Our interpreters, our prose and poetry kids, they need that audience sitting out there listening and watching their body language. They need that reaction. I think if virtual has done anything as far as impacting our contest, many of you would agree that oral interp has probably suffered more than any because of that need for that audience participation and that audience reaction that is so very inherent. It was a little bit easier, I think, for debaters to put on their headphones, go in their room, be isolated, and run those debates from their bedrooms. I don't think that was as much a struggle for them as it was for those performing arts kids. But there are some good things that happened. And one of those is that our judge pool could be so much more expansive. You could get really high quality judges from all over the state and even out of state, people that you knew. And sometimes even, I know for state speech, we actually tapped into UIL state champions who now live in New York or who now live in a totally other state, California, et cetera. But they were excited about being able to judge and be a part of our state's pool. And they could do that because they were sitting at a computer at their home thousands of miles away. And that was pretty cool. It also means that your judging pool could be more balanced. You could work with diversity and you could enhance your gender balance. And most importantly, I think in a lot of ways, you could have that geographical balance that we so want. Sometimes coaches say, well, why do you ask us to bring, why do you require a judge for CX State? We do that because we want a geographical balance. We run over 900 rounds. So that's a ton of judges. You would not want, even if we could find that many judges in the Central Texas Austin area, would that be a good idea? It really wouldn't be. It's important that that judging pool be very highly balanced with lots of those things. We need that diversity. Well, if I can go out of state or I can go across the state and have someone judge via computer, I've enhanced that judging pool. So I think that was important and something very positive that came out of virtual. The other thing that was positive was competition could be more diverse. If you're in a rural area and there's not a lot of speech and debate going on around you, you may not have the travel budget that you need to go all the way across the state. In my colleague states that like Kansas and Missouri, those are tiny states. Do you know they have rules that say schools cannot travel more than 250 miles to a tournament? Well, that almost makes us laugh as Texans, doesn't it? Because you well know if you're in El Paso, you're in the panhandle, you're in Big Spring, Texas, you're getting, you know, 250 miles is still not necessarily going to get you as far as you need to go to hit a quality tournament. So that's what was really exciting. I think people with small programs, people with rural programs, people that have very little budget this year could actually have their kids compete with more diverse kids from all the way across the state. And sometimes some of you even had your kids virtually engaged in uh, out-of-state tournaments. I know that as state director, most of the states, uh, if you're going to compete out-of-state, your tournament has to be sanctioned by the state office. So I'm the person, the key person at UIL that gets all of that, those sanctioning papers. Um, if you're not in good standing with your state association, then you're not approved to compete. So I got a lot of paperwork and I noticed a lot of Texas schools were headed to Kansas and Missouri particularly. Kansas has very strong policy debate. And so a lot of our debaters were able to tap in and not wait till June at the National Speech and Debate Tournament to hit those teams, but to actually be able to debate them 
right now during the invitational time. Another thing I think that taught coaches, I've often said when people say UIL rules are very, very strict, I say you have no idea what the rules are like in other states and how much more restrictions are placed on those forensic teams than UIL ever thought about. And as you all begin to branch out and debate and to compete with those other states, I think you began to see, first of all, styles. You know, sometimes in Texas, because we have multiple organizations that do compete with different styles and different rules, sometimes people think UIL is a little more traditional. And what they found when they went out of state is we're actually more the norm with other states than some of our other organizations. Um, and so that's an interesting thing. But I think because of virtual, we got to increase a more diverse competition. So not, not all bad. Those are not bad things. The other thing it may have done for you, and I'll want your feedback later, is was it a little bit easier sometimes not to have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to meet the school bus and get your kids on it and travel several hours to get to a tournament? Was it a little bit easier to sleep in some and then go to your school and meet your students? Or sometimes your students were competing from home and all you had to do was check in with them. And then you sat at your kitchen table and you fulfilled your judging responsibility that way. Sometimes maybe in your, well, hopefully not totally your PJs, but probably in more casual wear than you might wear at an actual tournament. So perhaps for a lot of coaches, particularly in Texas, when there's such a demand to go to lots and lots of tournaments. Maybe one of the things virtual did for you was that it reduced that wear and tear on you because after a while you get tired, don't you? And you need a rest. And perhaps those virtual tournaments gave you more of that in an environment that was much less stressful uh, than all the travel and the late nights and the hotel rooms and all of those kinds of things that you deal with when you're traveling across the state. Obviously, it helped your travel budget. I talked to one coach who talked about the thousands of dollars that were still in their budget at the end of the year and the, and the superintendent and principal coming in to talk about that and discuss so, um, but sometimes maybe you had to balance expenditures. Maybe you had to use some of that travel budget and shift it over to the technology that you had to improve in order to get microphones or headphones, or maybe your kids started out with Chromebooks and you saw what a major issue that was by not being able to facilitate Zoom and some of the, the other virtual platforms that were being used at tournaments. I think to some degree, it forced us to tap into our creativity. It's not that we're not always creative, but I think it stretched us. I think it pushed us to try to be more creative and certainly to collaborate. You realized you didn't have all the answers and you had to reach out to people who did and you had to brainstorm with your students. How do we make this happen? How do we make this happen when you've got three siblings at home uh, that need that same computer you do for an entire day of tournament? How do we make sure that that can all happen? I think the other thing, and, and my Michigan buddies tell me this, and my Kentucky, um, I had the director at Kentucky say, we will never now, after having virtual tournaments, shut down a tournament, cancel a tournament in Kentucky because of bad weather. We have a lot of snow and there are certain times of the year where we just know to be ready that we may have to cancel a tournament. His comment was, I don't think we'll ever have to do that again because we have the tools that we know we can flip it to a virtual tournament if that's what we need to do. So it gave us an alternative answer to weather issues. And it certainly did that with Congress for us in February. So what else did we learn? I hope that we all learned in an appreciation for activities. Um, 
and that we began to realize you and I as coaches, and I coached for 21 years before I came to the state office. And so we know what it's like to change kids' lives through our programs. And we know that we contribute to the whole student. But I think the world became very aware of how essential extracurricular activities are in the lives of students. When those things were taken away, which we never envisioned ever happening, it made people appreciate them. It made people realize the efforts that a state association goes through in order to provide those. And I think when they were suddenly taken away and they were gone, wow, it hit us in an emotional way as well. And it made us realize we really can't take these things for granted. And I think we, we've always have. I mean, after all, UIL started as a debate society in 1910. Think of how many consecutive debate tournaments, state debate championships we've hosted. And all of a sudden, it's kind of weird because if you go to the UIL website and go to the debate page, you're going to see a link that takes you through the championship teams, the gold medalist since 19, you know, since we began. And it's kind of weird when you get to 2020 and suddenly you have that COVID note there, uh, very regrettably. But I think when it all disappeared suddenly, not just teachers and coaches, but I think parents became very much aware of how essential activities are to kids. And I think that became evident with doctors and legislators and the public to realize these are really essential. These are not just added on and, well, maybe we spend too much money or time. Maybe kids are too involved and spend too much time. I think suddenly they realize if you're going to educate the whole student and that student's going to be healthy emotionally as well as physically, they need those activities. I hope this is what you learned a lot. If you'll look at the screen, this is important to me. I hope you learn that you play a vital role in the social, emotional, and mental health of your students. I really hope that you realize that. Um, I think what we discovered was that your team, your squad, may be the only positive thing in a kid's life and in their everyday life, and that your squad and this competitions that you prepare them for provide oftentimes an escape, an escape from the stress and the pressures of their everyday existence. Sometimes we don't think about where those kids are coming from and why it's so essential that they be a part of a group where they feel like they belong, they fit in. And what we saw during the pandemic, lots of research going on right now about this, about the depression and the anxiety that teens have been feeling and suffering through because all of these things disappeared and they didn't have these special activities. So I think that what I hope you realize is that you were missing the opportunity to guide, to support, to encourage students. And you know, you do so much more than just coaching a kid. You actually coach them about life because how many of you have been instrumental in making sure that kid got their college application in on time or that debater of yours actually finished that scholarship application? It may not have been their parents or grandparents. Oftentimes it was you as their speech and debate coach. You're also the reason and your program often is the reason that kids attend class, that they show up every day. Sometimes you're the reason that they graduate from high school, that they might not have ever done that had it not been for speech and debate. Sometimes you're the reason that they were confident enough to get a job, uh, confident enough to decide, you know what, I think I can go to college. 
and this is how I can make it happen. It's you and the role you play as that coach that often saw that that happened. And I think during the pandemic, at least I hope you became more acutely aware of that critical role that you play in the lives of kids, not just the kids bringing all the trophies home, but those kids who tag along on the team and go to those tournaments and compete because they need you. You, pro you provide that focus and you provide that hope for kids. And you may be their most positive role model. So think about when they're not seeing you on a day-to-day -day basis, when the world has turned virtual and it has shut down and they are not building that relationship with you, they didn't have that positive role model. They didn't have that person sitting there saying, did you turn that college scholarship application in? Did you study for that AP test? All right, so I hope that one of the things you learned is the critical role that you play in the lives of those kids. What were the challenges that we faced? Well, well, you can see some things there I listed, inequities, budget deficits, travel limitations. And I think what we're going to see as we go into this next season is rebuilding and recruitment. What about that freshman that had already signed up to be on your team? So they went to those virtual tournaments, but they've never been to an in-person tournament before. Now, how does that impact their focus and their concept of what competition is really all about? Because they didn't get the full package deal, did they? So how, how challenging is that going to be for you as a coach that you're going to have to rebuild and you're going to have to re-recruit kids and you're going to have to convince them that life is going to go back to in-person, our fingers crossed, and that it will be good. I think those are challenges that we're all going to look at. I think budget deficits, I'm gonna tell you real honestly, uh, that's certainly one of the greatest challenges that we're gonna have at UIL. When you think about all the ticket sales that didn't happen because um, athletics couldn't have that 100% capacity, uh, whether that was football, state champions, basketball, volleyball, whatever, uh, budget deficits are going to be a problem with your school as well. They're going to get some recovery um, money, but how's that going to be spent? What's that going to be spent on? I don't know. And how do we deal with those inequities? How do we deal with the fact that oftentimes our own events in speech and debate highlight inequities? I think we're going to be forced as we should to tangibly address those inequities so that we make speech and debate much more accessible to all kids, regardless of what their background is. You know, we, we kept telling judges, don't judge on the quality of videos and the background and all. But I think what that showed us was we, it made us much more aware of what kids have and what they don't have, uh, what schools have and what they don't have, and how we're able to address that, I think it's going to either move speech and debate forward or it's gonna hold us back. I think these are some things that we need to think about and we need to consider. We need to look at traditional ways of doing things traditional ways of registering for tournaments, managing those tournaments through sectioning, et cetera. Um, I think some of the virtual platforms that developed and got even better during this year are certainly viable to stick around uh, and to use to make tournaments and their management much, much faster, easier, easier and less stressful. I think we need to look at paper ballots. 
you can't imagine the thousands of dollars that UIL spends on producing ballots for all of your districts, your regions, and the state tournament, and for those invitationals that people want, those paper ballots. I'm just not convinced that's ecologically good, and I'm not convinced that it really makes sense anymore. If you were someone who judged virtually, you saw how easy it is to do an electronic ballot. Yeah, I'm seeing some thumbs up, absolutely. I will also tell you that it increases the efficiency and the time schedule of tournaments so much. When we can get those ballots immediately after the round, because lots of those virtual platforms allow you to send in your ranks, submit those to the tab room, and then you go back and put all your comments in for the kids. So hopefully that's twofold positives. First of all, the tournament runs more efficiently. Tab room's not having to run around looking for you. Oh my, you didn't sign your ballot or, you know, your ranks didn't, you know, didn't match your individual. No, that can happen with e-ballots. So all of those struggles we have that slow down a tournament um, don't exist. They're wiped out. And I think that's a very positive thing from a tournament standpoint. But I also think it allows that judge to reflect and think and make sure that they get really good analytical comments on a kid's ballot. And nothing is greater as a learning experience than what that ballot can be. So they're not just putting good, good, yes, yes. No, 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 I think it obligates them even more with an e-ballot because you have extra time that you're allowed to really give that kid some meat and potatoes when you tell them what was good and what needs to be improved with their speech, their debate. You know, you can really take some time with that RFD. That's important, reasons for de decision. You've got that extra time. I know that uh, I'm notorious if I'm a judge in a round. I'm writing on the front of the ballot, I'm flipping it over and I'm filling in the, the backside. And I'm typically that last judge on the panel that looks up and says, you know, when the kid's like, Judge is ready. <laughs> yeah, I'm the last one because I am riding all over that ballot. I want that kid to get their money's worth from me that I offer them as much feedback as I possibly can. That's so easy when you're typing it up. And you know what else is great about those ballots? The kid and the coach can read them. They're not worried about your lousy handwriting, your penmanship. When they're typed, people can read the ballots. And I think that's incredible. So I know what I'm going to advocate. I'm going to advocate. We really seriously consider sticking with e-ballots. I think that's really important. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to unmute and talk to me about this one. So don't forget bullet number two. I'm going to tell you, uh, and I want to hear some of your feedback about expanding the use of the internet. In UIL, we've had some pretty strong feelings from coaches and feedback that they like the fact that we don't allow extempers to just Google topics in the extemp draw room and be able to try to put together a speech in that 30 minutes. <clears throat> we also have coaches feel very strongly about not wanting internet opened up in debate rounds or in Congress rounds. Uh, so that students could possibly, even though it would violate rules, contact their coach, contact a hired gun consultant standing outside the door to say, what argument do I need to have? You know, there's been some pretty strong feelings about that, in spite of the fact that there are other organizations that have moved to open all that up and allow unregulated internet access I think this is something we have to think about now that waivers had to be given in the virtual world. Obviously, you had to be able to use the internet in order to actually access your competitive space. Now, in the UIL waivers, that's what we restricted it to. You still were not allowed, and you would have been in violation of regular traditional rules that were still in place during the virtual pandemic, if you use that 
to gain an advantage, to contact people from outside the room, or to access um, files that you had not already organized. So I will tell you that at the June meeting of the UIL Legislative Council, there was a proposal, um, not from staff, but from outside, that was submitted to the council for the academic committee to look at expanding that use of the internet. It specifically was a proposal to allow internet use in extemporaneous speaking. And how I responded to the council was to say, this is not, this proposal can't just be isolated. We have to realize that if you decide that internet should be open and allowed for extent, the big picture is you're gonna also have to allow it in Congress, in CX and LD. So this is not a little decision. This is an important decision that impacts four different events, not just one. So think on that and chew on that while I finish. I'm almost finished with this presentation and we can kind of talk and dialogue about what your feelings are. Some people say, let's do the internet because everybody else does. You know, NSDA does, TFA does, you know, whatever. So what you need to know is lots of states don't. They're, they're, we are in the majority uh, when we line up with other states. But obviously these are circuits that Texas students participate on. And so sometimes they feel like it's easier if a kid doesn't have to remember how to do things differently depending on what championship they're involved in. So think about that, expanding the use of the internet. Lots of folks think that virtual meets should immediately go away and let's never do this again. But there's lots of conversation and dialogue as well about maybe we should continue to do some virtual meets. There were some good things that came out of virtual and they make it possible for more kids to compete in more different ways. So should there be hybrid meets? Sometimes you are hosting a tournament, but you have room restrictions. You've got a lot of entries and you just, you have to cut it off. You don't have enough space and facilities to have as large a contest as you would like if you had bigger rooms, more rooms and bigger facilities. So a hybrid meet could meet that demand. You could actually do your debate virtual which seems to work fairly well, and then do all of your individual events in person. So, you know, there's some thoughts there of how we could still tap into virtual in a very, very positive way. Should we continue with virtual meets? If so, um, how often, uh, how much provision? Do you wanna host one as an individual host? Um, and, or should there be hybrid meets? I think we, we have some changes there that we're going to see and we've got to make some decisions on. And the other concern I have tremendously is because speech people have been so resourceful and because they have made it happen virtually, there is concern about budgets for speech and debate and performing arts. Will your administration think, well, they made it happen and we didn't have to spend hardly any money on this, that, or the other in terms of travel, et cetera. So we just reduce the budget and we just don't go. We just say, go only to virtual. I think it's important that you be highly concerned about how to advocate for your program and how to do that actively now, as soon as you can, making sure that your administration understands the criticalness of in-person experiences. I've always said that the wonderful thing about UIL is far beyond the amazing competition is the journey that kids get to have. I think it's important that our regional sites be on university and college campuses, because sometimes that's the first time your student will have ever stepped onto one. They are not from a family that went to college, and it's the first time that they realize 
maybe I can go to college. I've seen that. I've heard that. I've had testimonies, even from my own speech interns, when I say, how in the world did you think you could come to this huge University of Texas and be comfortable when you came from this teeny tiny little school? And the comment back was UIL. UIL gave me that journey. UIL gave me that experience. And so I think that the journey of going to different towns and cities, going to different universities, eating in restaurants, going to see sites. You know, Jenny and I've been amazed uh, when we made Congress finals happen at the state capitol. How many kids have never seen their own state capitol? I just thought that was a vacation every family took. And you were brought to those, maybe because my dad was a big history buff and he thought we had to know all about that. But I'm amazed at how many people get to the state Congress meet and get into the super finals there at the state Capitol. And they're so excited about taking a tour of the Capitol because they've never seen it before. So advocate for your programs and advocate for in-person competition as much as possible. There's so many great things that come from that, but be aware there may be additional challenges for advocating that you've never had to advocate before. Let me also share that I serve as the chair of the National Federation Speech Debate Theater and Academics Committee. And one of the things we've worked on is a document for how to advocate for your program. And I, I will be happy to share that document with you, those links to that. Um, they exist on the National Federation website and we'll put you in contact. So that can help you as you prepare what your arguments are. Paper ballots, internet, virtual meets, do we go, do we get rid of them? Do we go hybrid? And how to advocate effectively for your program. Those are some of my reflections on the past. And again, I, I say what I said at the beginning of this presentation, probably it will be important to have the same session at the end of the next season so that we truly have the time and the experience to reflect on what was this pandemic like and what did it do and how did it impact us and our students and our speech and debate programs. I also think it's a way for us to try to embrace reimagining the future. What is that going to be like? So at this point in time, I'm going to say if you would like to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you would like to throw some comments in the chat, Jenny's probably been looking at that and because I haven't been able to, but also uh, if you want to verbally unmute and see if you have things that you want to share, certainly feel free to do that. I'm seeing Clint who tells us um, what I saw was that some schools were completely oblivious to how to maneuver within it. They aren't members. Oh, no. can't afford that, it. That, you want to talk a little bit about that? No, that that was that was an SDA. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jana, that was that was me. It's Anna. Um, I used to be at Maybank, but I've moved on. Um, what I saw was helping with some students, uh, some schools with their district, and most of them, like I had several uh, who had not used Tab Room previously, and they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know what to do with NSDA, and so we've always sort of. Uh, try to run through NSDA, build in through NSDA, um, but it was just trying to figure out where do these schools go who are not extending beyond the UIL spectrum and they don't understand tab room, which isn't exactly uh, super friendly. Um, so those schools who are who are primarily using just the UIL um, area in speech and debate, like what, where do they need to go? Uh, joy has disappeared and tournaments aren't being posted and um, and that those are the questions that are being asked of me right now um, from some other people who aren't aware of you know where to locate information or what to do now if there's a virtual aspect to it. Right. Well, and one of the reasons why for Congress and for speech uh, individual events we chose Speechwire 
Uh, we knew that uh, because people had worked with Tab Room and we were getting a lot of feedback about difficulty in learning that, understanding it, and, and lots of tournaments just really diverting to having to have certain key people across the state run their tournament. But, uh, because they were, they had learned to use Tab Room. We used Tab Room for policy debate simply because we knew that's what the debate community had been using prior to our meets, which come, you know, in the spring. So we felt like the policy debate would run effectively through Tab Room, and it did. It did. But we were highly concerned about the districts, regions, and states, uh, state meets and needing something that was much more like joy, much more intuitive, we thought, and had a lot of great customer service in that we knew that the owner of Speechwire would be there to facilitate during those tournaments if people needed help. So that's the reason we chose Speechwire for those and why we defaulted to Tab Room for policy debate. We did just do, if they're asking you questions, we ha actually had the speech of our find a founder and owner do a session yesterday uh, that was very informative and showed people how to manipulate things inside his tournament management system platform. So um, send them my way. I'll be happy to share some of that with them. Okay, thank you. Now, did I just see, obviously talking, I couldn't monitor chat, but Jenny, I think I see where you said uh, Melissa made it in on her phone. Melissa, are you here? Did Melissa make it in? It's like a seance. Melissa, are you here? Can you hear us, Melissa? Okay, I, I'm, uh, I'm seeing that Miriam's saying if we could prevent students from accessing pre-made speeches, the expert, I definitely would like to see internet used in extent debate and Congress. I think it would address some of the inequities. Uh, I don't know, you know, inequities, uh, some people have to pay for hotspots because, and there again creates a big inequity if you're going to have to pay for a hotspot because you can't get internet. So does that reduce inequities or does it make it even more stark? You know what I'm saying? There's a big picture there you got to look at. I, I can I see. Yeah. Um, sorry, I kind of see that in the same aspect when I was judging um, the students who, even if they had a, a uh, speech that was written, you could see them reading it. Um, and so I, there was a question um, on the Facebook page, uh, page at one point that asked, you know, would you, would you prefer a student to stand up or to sit down when they're giving their speech? And I always say stand up. Um, mainly because when they're sitting down, it's, it looks like they're reading. You can follow their eyes, they're reading, and it comes out, you know, just they're going through a list, like almost they cut and pasted it from the internet. Um, and so I feel like there's, there might be a, a leverage there to say, you know, if they have to stand or something so that they're not right at the screen and it doesn't feel like they're just mechanically reading off the screen. Um, but as a judge, I could see it. And I would always lean towards this, the um, speakers who gave their speeches um, what seemed more extemporaneously. I would lean towards their speeches first when I was when I was judging. So I don't know if that would help within the range of this questioning um, as to whether or not we can keep them from having pre-made speeches, but they definitely would be able to read majority of the pre-made speech if they're standing away from their computer and they're moving as though we as we normally expect them to. Yeah, and the challenge there is staying within the virtual box when they move, because I know judges made that kind of comment a lot of times at tournaments. I think uh, in talking with my state staff that work as monitors in the uh, extent draw, obviously they're concerned because that's their focus and that's their job and responsibility is how you monitor. And my question for those of you who host tournaments, district invitational, how many monitors do you normally place in your extent draw? 
and how would that be impacted if the internet access was added in order to monitor no pre-prepared speeches and all the other things that we know are prohibited on the computer. If they're going to have pre-prepared speeches, they're going to have pre-prepared speeches on there. I mean, if you're going to get lucky enough to have prepared a speech for some of the random things that Jana comes up with, um, more power to you, man. Why if you not random, <laughs> well, not just totally random, but um, <laughs> it, more power to you. I mean, it just, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, I'm, I'm of, of two minds. Uh, I think it, searching the internet would probably take more time in extent, more time in debate to find the uh, what you're looking for, and so you're actually wasting your time doing the internet rather than going through your files that you already have. So, uh, you know, but I'm, that's why I'm of two minds to that. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think we need to do it, but if we're gonna do it, I mean, other people do it and it, it doesn't seem to give anybody any kind of competitive advantage. Yeah, and Clint, I wanna, I wanna key in on a phrase that you talked about pre-prepared. So my question for you, you know, I'm, my bottom line is always what's educational for kids, you know, what, and, and I think the educational value of extent, the tremendous educational value is the pre-tournament research, filing, highlighting, analyzing, reading, reading, okay, pre-tournament. And uh, I think we saw challenges with that when we started seeing extent programs that most everybody goes to now, which is, you know, uh, and I won't call the names of those products, but you know what I'm talking about, that already gather and file all that for you. And so I think our question is, Will it impact negatively pre-tournament prep? I, I think we all would agree that the cream of the crop's gonna rise. You know, if you're Googling a topic in prep draw for 30 minutes, you know, in that 30 minute time, you're likely. Now that's not to say that a really smooth speaker couldn't schmooze some judges, but I also would be concerned about accuracy of source citation, which we already are challenged with, with the internet system and so much news coming in all the time. Um, you know, how accurate are those sources going to be if that student is just finding those during that 30 minutes? So my, my real view is, can we just analyze the educational value. Now, is the world Google? Yeah. Does the world Google everything? Absolutely. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? You know, I think that's what we as teachers and educators have to answer. Any other comments or, or uh, approaches to what you think about the internet? You know, just saying, oh, let's do it because everybody else does it doesn't float with me, but I want to know. Okay, somebody saying, Sean saying, yeah, you would need more adults in the prep room. My question for you is, are you going to have those adults? Are you going to be able to provide those monitors? I can provide them at state. I got enough people that would be willing to do that. Can you do that at the district and the region level? Uh, no, that would be a big no, especially for the district level, potentially at region since you have so many schools there, but at at district, absolutely not. Okay. And, and how do you feel about somebody? Brittany says it would be really hard to enforce the rules. Um, are you willing to say, you know, we just want you to have integrity and if we catch you, it's going to be the death penalty. But, you know, are you comfortable with that? Or do you want those rules enforced as well as possible? Enforce the rules as well as possible. Absolutely. I don't know about the consensus with the rest of the group, but enforce, enforce, enforce. What about uh, e-ballots? What's your response to that? Love them. 
love and why do you love them clint well for the the things that you said uh the it it allows the the tournament hosts to know when a room when a round has started um i i thought after after we go back to normalcy if we did away with e-ballots we still would need i i would love to see a like a check-in like a app where you go you just check in to to say that the room has started Uh, that way people don't have to go run around and see whether judges are in the i'm really glad you brought that up clint because i'm sure jenny's sitting there look at her head shaking (laughs) jenny Jenny oversees our student interns uh and i'm telling you guys at the cx state tournament if you've ever been there you know that we have a whole we have all these buildings we use nine different buildings and we got this what we call the six pack that's probably not a good thing to call it but that's what ut calls it we have these buildings that we send these students out i mean they are exhausted after 900 rounds, checking to make sure that all those debate rounds have started. And that is a major plus with these ballots because that judge clicks on that and lets us know in the tab, we know instantly if a round has not started as opposed to having to have the walkie talkies, you know, eight to 10 kids out there scattered all over the campus, you know, rain, snow, sleep, or hail, (laughs) letting us know, and then they have to radio to us, then we have to try to solve, problem solve, versus what we were able to do. One of the things I thought was so fascinating with CX State was literally uh, Dr. Edwards, Matt Murrow, we could just click in and say to any room and say, hello, this is the tab room, are all debaters and judge there? Yes. Okay, thank you. Get your debate started. I mean, and and just starting those rounds was so efficient. It was great. And then also you said, like you said, the results go to y'all almost immediately. Uh, tabulation speeds up. Anytime we can find some extra hours during the school year, that's uh, that's amazing for me, you know. Right. And in those e-ballots, a judge can't submit their ranks and then go back and change them. They can add their comments, but they do not have the power to change their ranks. If for some reason they messed up and gave us the wrong ranks, then they have to go through the tab room and it's the tab room officials that makes that change. So that just adds a layer of consistency and security, I think, there. I have a question for people like Sean Duffy and and those of you out there that may be in TERP people. The only worry I have about e-ballots is this. Can you answer this question for me? I'm very protective of my little prose poetry people, as you know, my interpreters. What is it like for an interpreter? And I want them live. I don't want this, you know, send in a video kind of thing because there's copyright laws that have been violated all year long and I'm not gonna do that at UAL. But what I wanna say is uh, how is it as a student is performing and we're in this, you know, we're all enraptured in this amazing performance and maybe that, you know, we teach them about pauses and quiet and all these things that are important in a performance. And then a judge is clicking on their keyboard. Tell me how disconcerting that could be. Well, I don't know if that's any more disconcerting than your judge that writes the whole time that you're performing. That's me. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm one of those judges. I, I speak from that spot because I'm one of those judges as well. So <laughs> I e- echo what you said earlier about that. I don't think it would be distracting. And I think the majority of judges would be respectful enough that they're not going to be pounding on the keyboards to where it would be distracting. I think it, I think most judges would appreciate the ability to be able to type their ballots. Because going back to what you said earlier, so much of what we get back is so hard to decipher what they wrote. So yeah, I I would be all for it. I think the the kids would be good with it too. You know, but it's uh, also, I think what you can also, some people can type while they're watching the performer as well. So, I mean, you've got that, it, it solves a lot of problems. Just in my humble opinion. 
Well, and John talks about how punctual we can end our tournaments. You know, one of the things that we commented, our staff was significantly reduced because of um, at state tournament because of cost and, uh, you know, just impact to the UIL budget. And I had to figure out a way to still run all these tournaments, but not have as many people, et cetera. And one of the things we commented as we were walking out from the day one of CX debate was, my gosh, we're not near as tired <laughs> as we usually are physically. It was very, very interesting. And I think it was that virtual situation where we weren't going up and down stairs and escalators and elevators and all, or going to check on rounds that, you know, had problems and all of that. That was pretty interesting um, and kind of something that really soaked in with us as we were walking out that first night was, wow, um, you know, we used our brain a lot, but our physical wasn't near as tired. And that was, that was kind of interesting. So, so yeah, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing Brittany saying, yeah, half the time we can't read, especially the carbon copies. Yeah. A lot of times with debate and NCR, we're having to make, you know, coaches come to the tavern. We're having to make extra copies on the copier uh, for that. Tell me what else, uh, share anything based on, you know, some of the things that I've talked about. I'm sure you all learn things beyond what Jenny and I learned as far as from the state office viewpoint, because, you know, you were, you were in the trenches with kids or without kids, as the case may be. Uh, you know, there were a lot of kids that couldn't go to the school and compete because the school was shut down and they didn't have permission to do that. So they had to compete at home. Um, and, I, you know, what kind of struggle was that? Did they have the equipment they needed? Or was that anything that you all had to face? I know my son, his school allowed them to go up. They were each in a different room, uh, you know, down a hallway. They were assigned a hallway that they could use and, you um, the kids came in and each competed from a particular room and they judged from a separate room. And then there had to be, you know, food uh, runs to uh, fast food or something to make sure because they couldn't bring in food because of the pandemic and all. But uh, as far as couldn't have a hospitality type kind of room, what are some things that you, you faced or that you learned? Well, the kids are very resourceful. They, they, they take things a whole lot better than we do. Uh, the, only, the only time that, uh, hold up. The only time that, that we had any kind of from home deal was during Congress when we had ice Mageddon, snow Mageddon, and everything like that. So we, we didn't have a whole lot of competing at home stuff. But even at that, um, and when they would have problems with it, with their internet at home or something like that, they would, I mean, they balance better than we do, in my opinion, so. Yeah, I would agree with you that kids were much more resilient than we all probably were, uh, because they're much more comfortable. They cut their teeth on technology in ways that some of us obviously did not. So yeah, I think when you turned it over to your kids, a lot of times they had answers and they were much more comfortable with, hey, we have an issue. We've got a connectivity issue. They all understood that you need to be hooked. You know, you, you needed that ethernet cable to your router and all that. They know all that stuff and they know how to do it. So really in a lot of ways, if you just turn it over to them, they were able to be very, very resilient. The actual biggest problem that, that I saw during the year was when kids were competing on team events, um, CX, Duet, Duo, what have you, uh, World Schools, and they had to be in separate places, how they were communicating with one another. And then the other, other problem I saw was uh, sharing files and information between opponents that was taking... But uh, at nationals this year, it just seemed like it took forever in PF for them to 
email each other evidence. So those are the only two big glaring issues that I saw this year. What else, what else did you guys learn or what have you come out of this or how are you gonna do things differently as the season begins? You're still it, thinking about that. Yes, Jen, I know, I'm sorry. I've been doing AP all day, I just got done. Um, I told Clint, one of the things that I really enjoyed was the ability to have our kids spar with people across the state in different areas as we were prepping for some of the bigger tournaments. So I love Zoom ability for that purpose. I mean, we, we were debating against kids from Arkansas to get and ready. California, to, California get ready to, to, to get ready to go to nationals. So, to nationals, so it yeah, and I think that's a that's certainly something that should extend into the normal world is virtual practices, you know, uh, gosh, and something probably I need to think about when we start talking about certification for CX and what can count and what can't. I do think that having those virtual practices with people incredibly valuable. Anything else anybody would like to add or comment or disagree with me on? Maybe you don't agree with some of the things. And I'm I'm real sad that Melissa wasn't in because she had a lot of great things to share with you as well. But um, anything you would like to expand on or? Hey, hey, Jenna, this is Mark from Houston. Can you hear all right? I can hear you. I wanted to ask people um, another thing about e-ballots. So one of my concerns was that normal tournaments when paper ballots would come through the ballot table, I always had the sense that the ballot table staff could do a quick check for quality, see if there's errors. One of the things that I wondered about all year was some of the things getting missed that a ballot table personnel would usually be able to uh, catch. What, what was everyone's perspectives with quality of ballots coming in? Like, were there judges just sending in really short, bad ballots or were, was the quality still good? I had um, one or two judges who sent in um, almost copy pasted ballots at one point. And I have um, one of them, I specifically said, I can't hire you again if you don't actually help. You're supposed to be providing um, good uh, ballots the kids can't grow without this information um and so that was one big issue i saw that i couldn't see originally i don't know if it, it matters if it were um, in person or not um, the other one was kind of a cold call off of tab room they just emailed me and said hey i judge can i judge for you and i said sure um and then i just chose not to ask them to judge for me again because i believe that judges ought to be providing quality um to, uh, ballots uh so that our kids can grow so um i think that's that was kind of it. It was just very short, like, hey, good job, blah, blah, blah. But I always try to tell my judges prior to tournaments, um, there's a reason we're here. Most of them know, but some of those new ones, I, I try to make sure and let them know the students are looking for quality ballots. Well, and if it's a new judge for me, uh, even though I've done their resume, I've checked them out, et cetera, we take the time. We can't possibly read every ballot in tab, although some coaches think we should, but that's not feasible at the state tournament. But we do really watch and we do read those ballots of new judges that we've not used before. And we quickly filter those out, <laughs> you know, even before the tournament is over. And we certainly mark it down in our book that this is not somebody that we would want to 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 hire again. You want to be careful and you want to spot check enough that you see, are they just cutting and pasting the same comments from one contestant to the other? That would be disconcerting. Uh-huh. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right, Christy. Christy White. Oh my gosh, we must have talked a million times and had a 50,000 emails, Christy. I'm laughing when I say that because you were precious. I love when coaches really want to know and learn. And, and Christy was working so hard to build a program and make sure that she was as prepared as she could be as a coach. 
and she says very positively, I appreciated everybody who was patient, positive, good humored and such. Uh, it makes everything so much more pleasant and less stressful, especially on us newbies. Um, I would also say, um, you know, so many people rant uh, on social media. I would challenge you guys to go back on social media and say something extremely positive. Um, those comments can be very hurtful. They can also be damaging, I think, to teachers and coaches and judges. I saw where many judges were being ostracized and uh, because somebody didn't like the comment that they made and, and, and another coach made that comment like, wow. you know. In fact, it was a former UIL state director who used to have my position uh, who said, gosh, things have changed a lot since I was director because, and it wasn't even a UIL tournament. It was a, another tournament out of state where somebody was unhappy about what a judge had said. So they went on social media and just went on these really strong rants and all. So I would challenge you that, um, yeah, you're right, Christy, kids see everything that we do. And if you think they don't see your social media uh, post, uh, believe me, they do. And, and that's, again, that role model that you have to be. And that's just a part of being an educator is that you really need to be that positive uh, role model. I've often wondered sometimes if administrators could see some of this social ranting, you know, would somebody have a job? <laughs> I would challenge you to go on and make really positive statements. Uh, about a tournament or situations or you know whatever uh, and that might throw a loop into some of the ranting that we sometimes see that becomes real toxic guys it, it really has become toxic on social media so if you are somebody who enjoys social media I would say you know make that your goal to be positive and maybe turn around and flip some of those uh, very negative comments that happen. I, I just want to say thank you guys for sticking with your kiddos, um, staying, you know, in this year. I know some of you even had COVID yourself. I cannot imagine what that challenge was like. I cannot imagine. I tried to listen a lot to my family that are educators and what it's like to be in the classroom when you're trying to teach kids online, but you're also teaching in person. And in some of those um, Un incredible demands that you've had but the fact that our community was so resilient you know there were a lot of people who canceled their events there were a lot of people who um, didn't find a way a creative way to do this was it challenging was it scary uh, to totally transform to virtual absolutely but I think you guys have done a great job and what you've shown your kids is that you are passionate and you care about them, and you're going to see that we are somehow reaching that point of being able to say yes. And it's because of you guys that UIL was able to say yes, we will have these championships, we will make them happen in spite of COVID, in spite of snow, in spite of all the challenges that some of you don't have a clue what we were facing on the backside of things. I'm glad you didn't have to know that because you really would have been worried. But the fact that together this community pulled together, uh, even in academics where some of you ran regional and state hubs, kudos to you because you were so committed to your kids that you would say, you know what, I'll do whatever I've got to do to make this happen. And so we saw that to fruition. And it's really because of you guys that we were able to do that. I want to thank you for attending this session. And again, we probably need to repeat it next year and, and look back a little bit further when we can step back. And gosh, I hope the pandemic's over by then. Who knows? But hopefully in the future, we'll be able to look back and, and see a lot more things. I wish uh, that I had started a journal from day one um, so that, uh, you know, my uh, grandkids and great grands and all really can, ex you know, can have an idea of what all this was like, kind of like my parents telling me about the Great Depression and the things that they lived through. So 
um, thank you guys. I hope this was interesting to you. And um, I'll be looking forward to any other kind of comments that you want to share with me. Please do share things that you think can uh, we should carry on from virtual and maybe some rule changes we need to have, uh, maybe some different approaches to the way we administer the tournaments. But we would appreciate anything. If you are someone who uh, did have a state champion this year, Yes, I'm aware you do not have your state champion pin. Uh, those will be shipped out, but they'll be shipped out uh, as the new season begins because we know some of you changed jobs uh, during the summer and we don't want them going to one school and you never getting them. So um, keep us accountable for that. We do intend for you to get those lapel pins because we know that's very special and important to all of you guys. And just thanks. Thanks for being who you are. I love this community. I love speech and debate. And you are what make it so amazing. Thank you. Don't forget your CPE credit.